died, okay? It's easy. Let's just think. If there is a heaven and a hell, okay, where do you think you're going to go when you die? Do you think you're good enough to get to heaven? Yeah, Okay, if you think she's a good person. So now we're just going to do what's called a good person test. Okay? I would like to comment on a series of emails between Matt Rolfe of Ivy Bridge Evangelical Baptist Church in Devon in the, in the United Kingdom, uh, a gentleman who's been sacked by Operation 513, and probably he's going to be sacked by uh, Ivy Bridge Church. Uh, uh, they're crazy if they keep him in church membership because he's destroying that fellowship completely, utterly destroying their reputation. And the other person in the conversation was a retired pastor with some great insight and some great comments in his emails called Pastor David Collins. Now, Matt Rolfe teaches something called Lordship Salvation. And I'm going to read uh, three lines from one of his emails to Pastor Collins. I've highlighted his comment in red, which is of particular interest. And again, here is another article by John MacArthur showing how repentance is a turning from sin to God in faith empowered by the Holy Spirit. And note this, and that somebody can't first turn to God without turning from sin. Now, what I've highlighted in red is the problem. That's called Lordship Salvation. And it's the belief that salvation is in some way not monogistic which means that God alone saves us but it's synergistic God saves us together with our own human works and one of those works which we need to do in order to be saved is repentance now this is rather complicated because I need to use a lot of long words justification sanctification justification could be regarded as the way of salvation it's not just a legal declaration. It is that, but it's something more. Because in justification, our sins are placed upon Christ, but Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. Now, there's four aspects of imputation in the Bible. When Adam sinned, his sins were imputed to all of his progeny, to all human beings, even to little babies. So everyone is born with what they call the doctrine of original sin, unless you happen to follow a lunatic like Charles Finney, of course, who didn't believe in, in original sin. It's not actually talked about very much today, unfortunately. Then the next two parts, as I've just explained, of the aspect of imputation is that Christ's righteousness is implied to a person at conversion. Okay, when the person is justified, um, Christ's righteousness is imputed to them, and their sins are imputed to Christ. So justification we could regard as the way of salvation, when God declares a person to be just with Christ's righteousness applied to them. The second big word is sanctification, and this could be the way of assurance of salvation. Uh, more simply put, we could describe it as holiness, a separation from sin. So the Bible talks about people being saved, the Bible talks about salvation, and justification is actually that act of salvation. But after we've been saved, there is a progressive sanctification where we separate from sin and we become progressively more holy as we separate from sin. So those are the two big words, justification, sanctification. Now, the next two big words are monogism and synergism. Monogism means one, i.e. God works alone, God saves us alone, God's the one who alone is working in us. And synergism means God and man working together. So I'm going to start off with two different positions. Um, in the Bible, the Bible position is that justification, remember that's the way of salvation, we're declared just, Christ's righteousness is, is implied to us, our sins are given to Christ, in, imputed to him um, on the cross, at justification. Justification, the way of salvation, according to the Bible, is monogistic. This is very important. The one who declares us just is God alone. It's not God together with man working together, and what we do together with God gets us justification. 
Justification is the gift of God. It's not something that we work for. It's not something that we earn by our own good works. However, sanctification, remember that's the way of assurance. It's holiness. It's gradually becoming more separate from sin as we progress throughout the Christian walk. That is very definitely synergistic, not monogistic. So let me go through that again. The Bible teaches that justification, the way of salvation, is monogistic. God alone saves us. No angel is working with God saving us. Um, we can't help God in this act of salvation by doing good works or good deeds. God alone, and only God alone, saves human beings. Monogism. Justification is monogistic. But sanctification is synergistic. In sanctification, once we become saved, then for the rest of our Christian life, the Holy Spirit works in us, gradually perfecting us, gradually separating us from more and more sin, making us holy, in other words. But we, we never arrive, we never become completely holy, we, 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 we always fail, we always sin. It's only in eternity that sanctification is going to be perfected. Now, why is justification monogistic? The reason is this. In the Old Covenant, the Old Covenant was a covenant between God and man. And God gave 613 laws for men to keep. But Israel couldn't keep those laws. The only person who ever kept those 613 laws was Jesus Christ. So the Old Covenant failed because men couldn't keep this Old Covenant. So why, why is the New Covenant which Christians are under, why is the New Covenant monogistic? And the reason is that in the New Covenant, it is a covenant not between God and men, but between God the Father and the Son of God, Jesus Christ, mediated through the Holy Spirit. I'll read Hebrews 9, 13 to 15. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the pu purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from good works to serve the living God? And for this reason he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So it says it's the blood of Christ who offered himself to God the Father through the Holy Spirit. In other words, in the New Covenant, it is a covenant between two parties, mediated through a third party, the Holy Spirit, God the Father and the Son of God, Jesus Christ. They're the two parties. Because God the Father keeps this covenant perfectly, and because the Son of God, Jesus Christ, also keeps this covenant perfectly, the covenant is never broken. That's why it's an eternal covenant which will never be broken. We are not a party to that new covenant. It's not God the Father makes a covenant with Jesus Christ and me, Robert Skinner, or Joe Bloggs, or somebody else, and me and Jesus, we make a covenant with God the Father, and, you know, that's how we are saved. No, it's God the Father makes a covenant with the Son, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. That is an eternal covenant. It will never be broken. And it's then given, it's mediated as a gift to God's church, to his people, by or through the Holy Spirit. So that's the Bible position. To recap, justification is monogistic. Justification, the way of salvation, only by God alone, monogism. But sanctification, once we are born again, once we are regenerated, once we're justified, the rest of our Christian life, we're gradually, gradually sanctified, made more holy, um, separated from sin, made more holy. Um, and sanctification is synergistic. It's us working with God. Now, let's consider the Roman Catholic position. In Roman Catholicism, justification and sanctification are both synergistic. Because in Roman Catholicism, the grace of God is mediated to his people, they claim, falsely by the way, through seven sacraments given usually by priests and through the Roman Catholic um, priest, priesthood. 
So, for instance, when the priest holds the baby in the arm and he baptises the baby, then the Roman Catholics would say that that baby is now saved because of the human work done by that priest. Uh, rather like the Jehovah's Witnesses and their new light, uh, the Roman Catholics also have new light. They keep changing their beliefs every generation or so. So I believe very recently they've done away with um, the idea that babies who are, who are not baptised are going to go to Limbus in Phantom, a place of suffering for unbaptised babies. Uh, they've done away with that, apparently. Rather like the Jehovah's Witnesses keep changing their views all the time. But for hundreds of years, for centuries, Catholics have actually taught that, um, you know, if a baby's not baptised, it's going to go to a place of suffering for all eternity, Limbus in Phantom. <clears throat> so, you have seven sacraments in the Catholic Church, and men and women and children have to work with the priest in doing these good works, doing, uh, up, up, sorry, obtaining these sacraments, doing good works, and therefore justification in the Catholic Church is synergistic. It's God working with man in justification, which is wrong, okay? The Bible teaches monogism. But the Catholics are right when it comes to sanctification. They're right that sanctification is synergistic. It's God working with man. So, let me recap again. The Bible teaches that salvation is monogistic. It's God alone who saves us. Justification. But it's uh, synergistic. It's God and man working together in sanctification. The Catholic position is that justification and sanctification are both synergistic. Now, there's another movement... Um, I could mention it briefly, the Keswick Higher Life Movement. I don't know what they believe now because they're probably taken over completely by Charismatics and Pentecostals and who knows what they believe. They usually don't know what they believe themselves. But when the Keswick Movement started in the late Victorian age, this was a movement that was... Um, they went to the Bible position. Justification is monogistic. It's God alone and it's instant. So they reason like this. If justification is instant and it's by God alone, then surely sanctification should also be instant. They, they weren't too keen on promoting monogism, but um, they, they emphasised if, if you're justified immediately, you know, an act of a justification happens immediately, then sanctification must happen immediately as well. So they believed in what was called a second work of grace. Um, when the Pentecostal movement started later, this became the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the Keswick movement differed from both the Bible and the Roman Catholic position. They taught that both justification and sanctification were instant. And some of them, there was a wide range of different views within the movement, but some of them would, would stress, well, they're both monogistic. Um, but it's instant. That's a very small movement today, but I, I point that out out of interest. So let's deal with Lordship Salvation. In fact, before I do that, let's deal with the Oneness Pentecostal movement, which I was involved with in the mid-1980s when I lived in London. As a young man, I got roped into a cult, an anti-Trinitarian cult called Oneness Pentecostalism. The um, um, apostolic movement is also called. A very cruel movement. I confessed all my sins to my pastor. I was in the movement for about nine or ten months, and when I left, the pastor himself gossiped, gossiped all my private sins that I'd repented to him. You know, you have to confess all your sexual sins and what, whatever other sins you've done. It was gossip round the church by the pastor himself. <laughs> so I learned from that, um, be very wary of trusting pastors. There are some good pastors, obviously, like um, Pastor David Collins, who comes across as a very godly man in his letters. Maybe I might not agree with all of his theology, but I can see Christ in his writing and the way he uh, teaches and reflects uh, Christ in his um, emails but um, boy have I met a lot of uh, nasty people <laughs> in um, evangelical Christian circles now the oneness Pentecostals taught me that to be saved you had to do three things you had to repent you had to be baptized and you had to speak in tongues and they likened it to going aboard a ship if you want to go aboard a ship and get a, you know, a, a ship ride, a, a ship voyage, sorry, <laughs> not a ship ride, a ship voyage to New, to New York City, the first thing I'd have to do is get a ticket. Well, that's like repentance. 
The second thing I need is to get on the gangplank. You can't get on the ship if you don't walk on the gangplank. That's like water baptism. And the third thing you need to do is actually step off the gangplank and then step onto the deck of the ship itself. And then you're on the ship, and that's speaking in tongues. So you can see that the Oneness Pentecostal movement, which I was in in the 1980s for just under a year, they're very similar to the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church has seven sacraments. And remember, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that justification and sanctification are both synergistic, which means, you should know this by now, um, salvation, justification and sanctification are both God working with man. God working with man. The two of them work together, God and man, and when God and men work together then people are justified and people are sanctified. So if you believe that you have to repent, you have to get baptized, you have to speak in tongues before you're saved, then can you, can you see um, that that's actually synergism? What you're actually doing there is teaching that your good works, your effort, your human effort of repenting, got to repent, I repented to the pastor in private and it was gossip around the church, um, you got to repent, uh, you have to be baptized, you've got to speak in other tongues. I went to the front of the church week after week uh, to speak in other tongues and then finally I actually did it. Uh, and they said, Robert's got it, Robert's got it, Robert's got the Holy Ghost. I actually turned around on the stage at the front and said, it's rubbish. It's just babbling I'm making up. <laughs> um, but I so wanted that because I was told I couldn't be a Christian, you see, unless I spoke in other tongues. Um, but I'm a very honest person. So when I did it, I said, no, this can't be um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This can't be speaking in tongues because it's just babbling. Now, when it comes to Matt Rolfe, can you see... Where is Matt Rolfe's position? Because Matt Rolfe clearly teaches, let me read his quote again, and that somebody can't first turn to God without first turning from sin. Let me read it again. And that somebody can't first turn to God without turning from sin. Is Matt Rolfe's position monogism on justification and synergism on sanctification, which is the Bible position, or is Matt Rolfe similar to the Roman Catholic position and the Oneness Pentecostal position, albeit far more moderate, far more moderate, that justification and sanctification are both synergistic, which means that um, we're justified by God doing what Christ did on the cross, plus our good works. We've got to do our good works. And salvation, justification, doesn't come to us unless Christ dies on the cross on our behalf and we do our good works. Because Matt's, Matt's statement, and here again is another article by John MacArthur showing how repentance is a turning from sin to God in faith, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And that somebody can't first turn to God without turning from sin. You see, that's human works. He's treating repentance as a human work that we have to do. It's something we have to do in order to be justified. Now I'm going to read one more verse and it's Romans chapter 4, a verse I've used on Jehovah's Witnesses an awful lot. It's verse 5, Romans 4, 5. And sometimes I misread this verse deliberately to make my point, but I'll read from verse 3. Romans chapter 4, verse 3. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believe on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. And sometimes that verse, Romans 4, 5, I misread it when I'm speaking to Jehovah's Witnesses or to other similar cults. But to him who works and believes on him who justifies the godly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Because that's how Matt Rolfe understands Romans chapter 4 verse 5. If you work, you repent, you do all this repenting that Matt Rolfe wants you to do. And you are a godly person because you've repented of your sins. Then, once you're a godly person who's done your repentance, then God justifies you, then God saves you. Can you see the problem with that? It's synergism, it's the Roman Catholic position, much more moderate than the Roman Catholic position. I'm not saying Matt is a Roman Catholic. 
It's far, far more moderate. But nevertheless, there is a small element of synergism in this lordship salvation that Matt Rolfe uh, is advocating, uh, Matt Rolfe of Ivy Bridge Evangelical Baptist Church, and his uh, patron saint, uh, Ray Comfort, of course, who, who also promotes this, and John MacArthur. If you believe that in the New Covenant we're saved by a covenant between God the Father and the Son of God mediated to the Holy Spirit, and then the Holy Spirit gives, uh, he mediates this covenant to God's people, to God's church, to God's elect, imputing Christ's righteousness to, to, the, to the people who are being justified and taking the sins of those people who are being justified and applying them to Christ on the cross. Can you see how blasphemous it is to say, well, you know, my good works, my repenting is actually um, because I repented, I got myself in a certain state that enabled me to be justified by God because I earned my right to be justified by my own good works. That's, I think, the problem that Matt is, Matt is making. Now, in conclusion, Matt is going to say that I am denying repentance. And Matt has given numerous scriptures where he mentions um, repentance in the New Testament. Of course, I believe in repentance. The classical um, reformed position, of course, it advocates repentance. But repentance isn't the cause of our justification, as Matt Rolf is advocating. Repentance is the fruit of our justification. Once God has saved us, and remember Romans chapter 4 verse 5, but to him who does not work, if you're trying to work for your salvation, you can't be saved. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. God doesn't save godly people who've done this and this and this and this off a checklist, whether it's the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church, whether it's the um, three-stage uh, system of salvation amongst the oneness Pentecostals, you know, uh, repentance, uh, water baptism, and speaking out of the tongues, or whether it is the admitted far more moderate but still an error, um, error of Matt Rolfe's lordship salvation that you've got to repent in order to then be saved. You repent before you're saved. You repent before your justification. What Matt, Matt fails to understand is that because salvation is monogistic, it's all entirely of God. Therefore, it's God who saves us. And because God saves us, he saves us apart from human works. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. Romans chapter 4 verse 5. God saves those who do not work, Matt. So because, because God saves those who are not working, therefore repentance is what happens after we've been justified. It is the fruit of our conversion. It is the fruit of our justification. It's the fruit of our being born again. Um, I'm going to finish with one other, one other thing, and that's Acts 2.38. You see, if you're going to take the idea of Lordship salvation, that you've got to repent, Matt, in order to be saved, then why not also take water baptism and teach that you have to be baptised in water in order to be saved? Now, of course, this is heresy. It is completely wrong. But as a former oneness Pentecostal, I spent... I've spent 25 years looking at this. Of course, you know, you never really spoke to me, Matt, when I was in your evangelism group. Um, you just kind of looked down on me, and uh, I was ignored by you and others in the group. You went off to the beach, didn't you? I lived alone in a 14th floor of a tower block, lonely, lonely person with, with no friends. Uh, but you and the rest of the evangelism team, every one of you went to the beach to have your beach parties. I saw the pictures on Facebook. I was staggered. I was never once invited to any of those. Um, you really didn't treat me as um, a Christian brother. You didn't treat me with any real Christian love. Um, but anyway, Acts 2.38. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. 
and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, if you believe that people have to repent in order to be saved, why don't you add water baptism to that list as well? It's wrong, it's heresy, and I can disprove it. But I'd like you, and of course you're not going to respond to me, you don't respond to anyone. Um, <laughs> any question that you're asked, you weasel out of it. Answer Acts 2.38. It says repent for the remission of sins, but it also mentions water baptism. Repent and be baptised in water for the remission of sins. So why don't you add water baptism to your list? And one final verse as well, Acts 22.16. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptised and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So Ananias speaks to Paul. He tells him to get up, to be baptised in water and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Could you answer that verse as well? I wish to stress, I do not believe in baptismal regeneration. The idea we have to be baptised in order to be saved is heresy. But if Matt is this great theologian who knows so much about the Bible, and when a, um, a good man, David Collins, retired pastor, 75 years old, writes to him, this little whippersnapper, Matt Rolfe, um, he's very rude to the pastor, and his... Uh, insulting wife says that um, Pastor David Collins belongs in a mental hospital with Susan Pepper. That was a disgusting, rude thing to say. But um, I've had far worse in my Christian walk. Uh, I've been treated so badly by these evangelical Christians. Um, the worst comment I've ever had uh, I asked somebody on um, a, a, um, a forum I was on, they, they were Assemblies of God girls, they were chatting amongst themselves in text. I said, please don't use the word G's, you see, G's. Uh, lots of Americans do that because it's the word Jesus being used as a cuss word. And they said I was lying, I was a liar, it's not true. I showed a dictionary definition of G's, that it's a derivative of the word Jesus uh, from a dictionary. I proved it and then they started writing little stories about me having sex with my own mother in different positions, being very graphic about, um, you know, what happens to men and women when they have sex. Uh, Christian girls, and they were Christian girls because I looked back on their posts for, for months and they kept talking about going to this church meeting and that church meeting and this church outing. Um, um, I'm not a Christian, I'm mad agnostic. I've never met a more disgusting, evil bunch of people um, than evangelical Christians. That's not to say they're all corrupt. I do believe there are some godly good people uh, amongst all of the Christian um, churches and groups. I'm not saying every single evangelical Christian in the world is is fake, but um, uh, I really warn you folks, um, be very careful of people like Matt Rolfe and these street evangelists like Operation 513. Um, they eventually sacked him when his involvement with a paedophile in his group became known. Um, these people don't love you. They, did, they didn't love me, <laughs> and they won't love you. Unfortunately, these people will just use you. And, and a lot of religion, a lot of organised religion, I'm not accusing all pastors, I'm not accusing good pastors like Pastor David Collins, okay? And there are good pastors. There are good pastors, occasionally you meet them, very occasionally. But so many people don't love you, and in Christianity, evangelical Christianity in particular, they just take advantage of you. So, after 30 years now, I made a profession of Christ in 1985. I really have to warn people, be very careful of evangelical Christianity, because it is a, a thoroughly dangerous, dangerous and wicked movement. Yes, a few genuine good people in it, but a lot of the people are stupid, a lot of the people are lazy, Men in particular are often spineless in these churches, but you'll find some absolute devils, devils in evangelical Christianity who will abuse you and take advantage of you, um, as has happened to me. So please learn from my mistakes. Thank you.